This is Mike Swanson of WallStreetWinner.com. I want to talk with you today about uh, some comments that Ray Dalio made in this book that came out earlier this year, The Changing World Order, Why Nations Succeed and Fall. Uh, the thesis of the book, uh, and I completely agree with the general thesis, is that we are in a time of economic uh, change around the world, uh, the rise and fall of various power structures in the geopolitical system. Um, this book came out before the war in Ukraine. And uh, that, you know, is an example of this. Uh, one example, uh, Nancy Pelosi's trip to Taiwan being another example. And this book uh, enables you to kind of step back and look at how different things have played out in global history, the history of global capitalism, really, since 1500, and, and how this has impacted the uh, investment cycle and how to adapt to it. It's sort of a look back at history uh, to help you navigate the future. Very, and it's more important to do this now than ever before. We have seen rapid changes this year in the financial markets that are making them trade differently than they have uh, before. Uh, the bond market, for example, being in a bear market at the same time that the stock market has been falling. But what I wanna comment on in this video is Ray Dalio's comments about uh, how currencies lose their reserve currency status. You see, the dollar is the reserve currency of the world. It has been that since the end of World War II in the creation of the Bretton Woods system. At, from then until Nixon took the dollar off the gold standard, the dollar was linked to gold. And in the 1970s, Nixon had to delink it because uh, the gold in the United States was being taken out of the United States because the debts got so big and people weren't sure what was gonna happen. But the US dollar re re continued to be the reserve currency of the of the world, even though it, all currencies then began to just simply float, completely delinked to uh, gold because the US dollar was pegged to it on the international trading market. Uh, there was an inflationary turmoil in the 1970s. Gold exploded in value. So, in oil prices, of course, went up too. But it was a time of financial turmoil and volatility that really uh, took uh, until 1981 or 1982 to really come to an end. And it took the Federal Reserve jamming interest rates to a very high level for that to happen. But that experience of the volatile 1970s uh, primed a whole generation of investors, frankly, older than I am, to be fearful that a dollar collapse could occur or something like the 1970s, but worse. And really, I, I thought there's some similarities to what we're experiencing now in the 1970s. But over the years, there have been various uh, promotions on the internet uh, to tell people to buy gold because the dollar was going to collapse and, and you needed it for safety and, as, and frankly, as a way to make a lot of money, if it happened, playing on both fear and greed to provoke people into buying gold or silver. And I'm bullish long term on gold and silver. And I think they're good investments. But I want to step back from that type of talk, which really primed to make people so emotional that they'll, you know, make a transaction. They're really selling people really hard. Uh, and this book enables you to, you know, by reading a book in a quiet place, you're not being bombarded by, you know, people trying to sell you or message you, or, you know, propagandize you. So what Ray Dalio says about the dollar is quite a bit different than what you may have been told in the past, even though he believes that the US dollar is gonna lose its reserve currency status. It's just how that happens. 
which is so, which is dramatically different from what you may have heard from stock market gurus, gold gurus, and in, in, in the so-called alternative financial media. And I just want to share with you two pages from the book. Now, this is one page, and this is the kind of stuff you've heard before. All currencies are valued or are devalued or die. So implication, the U.S. dollar is going to either lose value or it's going to come one day completely vanish. And he makes note that there, there, were, there have been 750 currencies that have existed since 1700, and only about 20% of them remain. I actually own a couple as collector's items, and, and, and they have no value. I can, you know, only as collector's items. The stores won't take them. They're not used anymore. He notes, for instance, if you, in, in uh, 1850, the U.S. dollar was around, the Swiss franc was around, but almost every other currency that was being used at, in 1850 no longer exists. Germany had the Thaler and the Gulden. There was no yen in Japan. In Italy, there were six currencies. Spain, China, and other countries had different currencies also. Um, and that's why the Swiss franc, since it's been around for so long, has actually historically been the most stable currency since the 1800s. It, people at times have treated it as good as gold. Um, it's it's the, the um, next page, though, where things get really interesting. And he breaks down, there's a lot in this book, but he uses as some case book examples what happened to the Dutch Empire, the Spanish Empire, and the British Empire before the rise of American hegemony after World War II or during World War II, really. But um, the biggest, you know, it was England that had the reserve currency before the U.S. dollar did, the British pound. And this is what's really interesting in this book, or one of the, or for what I want to tell you today, is that the actual peak in the British Empire in terms of its percentage of uh, dominating world trade was at 1850. And between 1850 and 1940, Great Britain was the biggest trading country in the world, the biggest exporter of global goods in the entire world, representing roughly 40% of that global trade. Now, in a, around the time of the Civil War, the 1850s, uh, people knew that the United States was a rising power and actually would likely displace England as the world's, you know, most powerful country in time. In fact, the communist Marxist Karl Marx, uh, in one of his writings, predicted that the United States and Russia would become the two most important countries in the world, you know, after 1900. And that one could argue he, he got a lot of that, that prediction uh, right. Um, the real rise though in the United States as an economic power really began, started around World War II. Uh, during that war, the United States began to, uh, Finance the, the 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 became the biggest uh, financier of debt in the world. It began to fund uh, World War One on behalf of the Allies, and it had debt. It had loans uh, with Japan, uh, to uh, Russia, um, and so forth. Uh, so it it I would say it's beginning. Uh, rise as a global superpower was in World War I. And in fact, you can see that with like the United States went over to Europe and became a di decisive factor in the end of that war. You had Woodrow Wilson, you know, becoming the first American president as a global figure. You had the League of Nations that he was promoting, the Versailles Peace Treaty, 
and so forth. So it was, World War One marked the emergence of the United States as a global um, power player. Yes, it, it fought the Cuban War, the Spanish American War, and had a few overseas adventures, but nothing up to that point was as big as the role it played in World War One, especially in the post-war settlement. And in the 1920s, the United States continued to lead the role, play the role as the most important uh, lender country in the world. It became the big lender of Germany um, in the 1920s. Uh, and, and all the, you know, the other uh, formerly allied countries too. But during that, during the 20s, the pound was still the world's reserve currency. And, and the remarkable thing is, if you really think about it, the pound was not displaced by the U.S. dollar is to become, the, the U.S. dollar did not become the global currency until the end of World War II. So for a good 90 years, after the peak of Britain's true economic dominance of the global trade system, um, the peak, it really took almost 90 years for the British pound to be displaced as the world's reserve currency. And after that, you could also argue that the decline of the pound, the value of the pound, was actually a slow process that played out over decades, even after it was displaced by the uh, U.S. dollar as a reserve currency. So there was not an overnight crash, like one night everyone woke up and the pound just collapsed in value and the dollar soared in value and, and all this. That's generally not how these things happen. The, the usage of one currency as a percentage of all global transactions slowly goes up and slowly goes down. It's not a 24 hour situation where things just change overnight. So the displacement of the US dollar, therefore, Dalio argues in history, his historical examples, and I don't really demonstrate it, so it's hard to argue against what he's saying, is that the process of the US dollar no longer serving as the reserve currency is not gonna be something that happens in a week or overnight, but it could play out over decades, where what, ha what would really happen or will really happen is slowly starting, is that more and more transactions will be taking place in other currencies. In fact, the Ukraine war is sort of speeding this up, but it's not causing the US dollar index to go down in value. I mean, more, all the transactions, there are many transactions of Russian oil, for example, that were taking place with US dollars or euros, and now they're not. Um, it's just one small example. It's just over time, other currencies will displace the percentage of transactions that the dollar is taking place on the global market, the Forex market. It's just what's going to happen. And so that's not something that you can really position yourself for because it's a slow process. And I don't think people should buy gold or silver on the basis that the US dollar is going to collapse or there's going to be this overnight crisis. I think there's other reasons to buy gold and silver. Now that is, and let me show you, I think, what I think is the most important reason to be involved in them in today's markets. So what you're looking at here is a ratio chart, dividing the price of gold with the S&P 500 to create a ratio. Um, if the ratio was one and just stayed at one, what it would mean is they both have the same exact value and the value never changes. When this ratio goes down, it means that gold, the price of gold is underperforming the S&P 500 in the global markets. 
when the S and P 500 goes up and gold goes down, this ratio goes down. Or if gold, or if they're both falling and gold is falling faster, this ratio would go down. As you can see, though, when the stock market, uh, this ratio made a bottom in 2000 and then went up to 2000 and to late 2011. What that meant was during those 11 years, gold did better than the stock market. Gold was a better investment than the stock market. Uh, it just was. The stock market went through a horrible bear market in the year 2000 to 2003. The price low was in the summer of 2002, but the bear market for the stock market didn't really end in 2003. And during those times, during those years, gold went up and then gold went up even faster than the stock market after the stock market went into a bull market in 2003. Gold was a better investment than the stock market during those, the, that time period. Now, after 2011, uh, gold then lagged the stock market dramatically until really the fall of 2018. Um, and now, since then, gold has been less volatile than the S&P 500. So when the S&P 500 has fallen, gold has fallen less. You saw that in 2020. In March, when the stock market crashed, gold fell less than the stock market. Gold fell a little more than 10%, and the S&P 500 fell over 33%. This year, gold went up in the first quarter while the stock market fell. Now gold's pulled back down to support. Uh, while the s and I mean, while the S&P is down around 20% year to date, still. Uh, what I believe is going to happen is in time, within the next six to 12 months, I expect we're going to see gold, this ratio go up through the high uh, of this year. And then it would start a bull market like it got into from 2000 to 2011, a decades long bull market. And that's why I think in any, in any portfolio, gold and silver now play a role, um, especially when bonds are in a bear market. We're in this time of high inflation, which shows no sign of coming to a real end. We're in a secular inflationary trend and a secular trend of rising interest rates. Interest rates are probably never going to go back below zero for the rest of our lives, if ever, frankly, because you go back through the thousands of years of financial history, and there never had been negative yielding bonds until the past couple of years. I don't think we'll ever see that again. It was a fluke. And it creates, I believe, a secular low in gold and silver to make them good long-term investment. That has, has nothing to say about what they might do next week or next month. I'm trying to plot out for you the bigger long-term trend. And it's important to keep your eyes on them and then use um, your more shorter term outlook for entry points to align yourself with a longer term trend. So we're in a tough time for investors who, as I said in a previous video, the 60-40 portfolio allocation system where you put 60% of your money and 40% of your stocks no longer is working because bonds are going in a, are in a bear market. Uh, in the past, the bonds would go up and stocks go down. Now they're both going down. That system is, is, van is no longer functioning and probably won't function again in, in any efficient manner for the next 10 years. And that's why alternatives to that system are now necessary. Gold and silver play a role as an alternative. And frankly, at this moment, probably the, for, for now, I'd say, to the rest of the year and maybe uh, 12 months, uh, even cash can serve as an alternative to bonds as a simple reserve to use uh, to help lesser the volatility in a portfolio and ride out the, uh, you know, this, the, the final six, you know, the, the rest of this down leg in this bear market. Personally, I don't have huge amounts of simply just cash on hand. I buy 
uh, very short-term bonds um, that just expire in a month or from 30 to 90 days. And I'm not, and, and I'm, I'm just parking the money and I'm letting them expire and get the interest. Um, bond funds fall in value up, but rise in value. I don't want anything to do with that. Uh, but just short-term, you know, bonds, I don't have a problem with. So I, I just wanted to share with you Ray Dahlia's thoughts on this one topic and how it applies to navigating the gold market and thinking about the U.S. dollar index. Look, I do videos about the news, politics, real estate, economics, and financial history. If you want more videos like this, hit the like button. If you're new to me on YouTube and you want to get my next video update, hit subscribe, hit the bell next to it, and YouTube will send you an alert as soon as it's up for you to watch. I'll be talking with you later.